Okay, so we're talking about the Baths of Diocletian here, the greatest baths of Imperial Rome. Here's a phenomenal rendering. So first of all, Diocletian, he sets up the Tetrarchy. He is, uh, you know, someone who brings Rome back from the brink. The empire uh, was at a low point in the third century after the uh, end of the reign of Alexander Severus in 235. And he's bringing a sense of normality. Of course, things have changed, but he does introduce a new system. He'll have a co-ruler, a, a fellow Augustus. And then he has two junior emperors, so the, the Caesars, the Tetrarchy. So he actually spends almost no time in Rome. Possibly he comes in after he defeats Carinus, possibly. But we know he's there at least once, and that's celebrating 20 years of his reign and 10 years of the Tetrarchy itself. There's an image of, with his uh, co-Augustus ruler, Maximian. And his impact on the city, you know, the primary thing is he has rebuilt, after the fire in the Forum area, the Forum of Caesar, the Basilica Julia, the Basilica um, uh, Basilica Julia and the Curia Julia. Okay, so what you see the remains of, you go into the Curia today, it's only 1,700 years old. It becomes converted into a church we talked about last week, converted into the church of St. Hadrian. So he doesn't do too much in Rome, but the big thing he does is has built the largest baths in the city. But uh, looking at the image here on the top from the reliefs of the uh, Arch of Constantine, recently struck by lightning in a storm in September. We have this relief that shows the forum. So the far left is the arches of the Basilica Julia. And then we have the rostra. And then we have the arches, uh, the three arcades of the arches of Temius Severus. So atop the rostra, they also have placed, Domitian has placed five columns. One, two, three, four, five. Here's the base of one of them, and it's in the form area still today, right at the foot of the rostra, but it's the base of a column. There were five columns, and each one had atop a statue, so it's the four co-emperors, and then the central one should be Jupiter. So that's another you know, impact uh, change to the forum from Diocletian. Okay, let's turn over to the Viminal Hill. Let's look at what's there before the palace is built. So there's the Temple of the Flavians here shown from the Gismondi plan in Aeor. Uh, there's a Hadrianic neighborhood, some of the frescoes of which are found inside Plaza Massimo today. And that's where the arrow is pointing over to Piazza Cinquecento in front of the Termini train station. There's also the end point of the Aqua Marcia, so it's known as the terminal point. And so you get the word Termini from that terminal point of the Aqua Marcia. And then, of course, you've got portions of the Servian walls that you can see there on the map. So there is a developed neighborhood in the second century with the remains of the Servian walls covered underneath the mound. And this area is known as the ramparts. That's why the walls were preserved. Of course, today they're exposed in front of Termini train station. So there's a bit of a neighborhood, uh, but the Flavian temple has to do with the location of the family house on the Viminal Hill. And it's right by the uh, the Church of Santa Susanna. So Diocletian then decides to bulldoze over some of the area and build these huge baths between uh, 298 and 305 to 306, 32 acres in size if we think about the outer wall circuit. These are the largest baths because even though the outer wall circuit's about the same as that of Caracalla, that central core, the Frigidarium, the Natatio, the Palestra, and the Caldarium, all of that is larger than the building core of the baths of Caracalla. That's why we say these are the greatest baths, the largest baths, and so on. Now, in terms of seating, it's also uh, identified as having the most seats for bathers, according to a 5th century historian. Okay, so 3,000. But obviously, within this space, there could be you know, 10,000 people uh, that, that visit the baths. So you have all these niches and the outer walls for theaters, for libraries, for 
uh, gathering places for meals. And then of course, number seven, this big exedra there is going to be a place for um, for sunbathing and also watching you know sports performed in, in the outdoor section. And of course, this one, unlike the Baths Caracalla, is part of the urban fabric of the city. And so therefore, it's going to be uh, in bits and pieces compared to the Baths of Caracalla. Baths of Caracalla is left alone. So uh, this one is something that's a little harder to read within the urban fabric of the city. So one thing about ancient Rome being recycled in different buildings have different lives. So this is an image, the outer, the outside of the uh, Church of San Bernardo. So it's a perfect uh, exterior building. It's the one in the bottom left-hand corner, the rotunda, the bottom left-hand corner. And it's easily converted into a church because the dome is still standing. We'll go inside the baths of uh, the central core baths and we'll see Santa Maria degli Angeli, which is retrofitted in into a church by Michelangelo in the 16th century. And of course, again, the vaulting is intact. So it's a pretty easy project. Within the central core of the buildings, you also have the insertion you see here in the plan, a large cloister. The Carthusian Charter House is inserted right inside. And then a number of the outer rooms are also converted into spaces for the storage of grain and olive oil in the time of the popes in the 16th century. Then you have the unification of Italy, heavy urbanization. The Charter House is abandoned. The Piazza de Exedra was constructed. So you have buildings on top of that large Exedra. You have the construction of the Piazza of the Republic eventually. And you've got uh, the insertion then within the baths, the uh, Museum of, uh, of the National Museum of Rome. Today it's called Museo delle Terme. But initially it was the sole location of the national collection uh, that was created with the unification of Italy. So here's San Bernardo. And those coffered ceilings, we're familiar with coffered ceilings looking at the Pantheon. This is the original coffered ceiling for the uh, for this building. I mean, it's a ready-made church. And you can see, as we have for the Pantheon and we have for bath structures, you have the oculus. So that's nothing unusual. We look at the exterior. There's a little bit of a, a little lantern you see from the exterior. And you can see again, as we pivot up, that there is a lantern uh, kind of construction placed on top of it, making it into a more recognizable uh, church feature. But in antiquity, that opening was uh, uncovered. That's, so that's a pretty extraordinary example. Here's the cloister. You see a conservator on the left. This is a huge structure. Look at this right here. Of course, today it just houses much of the uh, collection of statues and reliefs of the national collection. But again, it is uh, inserted right into the fabric of the pre-existing uh, walls. So from the exterior, you can see and the, the foreground, some of those halls that would be a part of the palestra and the changing room and so forth. And then the higher building with the with the much more impressive roofing system, that's going to be the frigidarium, the cold hall that is converted uh, into the church. Now, this is a view from the buildings in the Exedra. That's actually where the, the movie theater is, where I saw Gladiator 2 today. Uh, but from the hotel, you can see that the same structures on the right and then the frigidarium on the left. But well, we can also now pivot and get a sense of that exedra. Is that nice, magnificent exedra, that whole dimension there it was a big outdoor space. And even underneath these buildings that fit the curve, I'm standing in one and there's one opposite. They are actually standing on top of the exterior wall remains and uh, spaces of buildings. Uh, from uh, from antiquity. So the bath complex, just pivoting like this and looking at it, we're really getting a sense of how big the uh, construction was, built between 298 and 305, so that's extremely fast. It's mostly brick. And just down the street from this image, uh, uh, down the street on the left, you're going to have about 100 meters, you're going to have the San Bernardo structure. So it's an enormous enormous enterprise to build these bathing complexes. So we are basically looking at the curve of number seven. Down the street is San Bernardo, about 100 meters away. 
And then here is our, our central feature. So number one is destroyed, right? That's the entrance is actually stepping into number two for the church today. And then you have the Frigidar, and we'll see that in just a second, number three. And, uh, and then left and right, number five, are the palestra areas. And then Atatio is the swimming pool, like an Olympic-sized swimming pool in the back. So when we were looking on the exterior, we were looking at the low buildings off to the right. We're going to be changing rooms and, and, uh, and uh, probably other places for, um, you know, either sunbathing or getting rub downs or whatnot uh, on either side of number one and number two. Okay, this is the bathing facility. This is like a 19th century painting uh, in its heyday. And you can see again how large the Natazio is. You can see how many people are here. You can see the large scale of the statuary. And then I mean, there's some, some fantastical kind of, uh, uh, you know, frescoes and paintings, but all the marble would have been covering the lower half of the walls and the vaulting, yeah, the vaulting would have been uh, would have been decorated. So we can imagine at the least, at the least, white stucco work. Painting like this, pretty magnificent, pretty uh, maybe a little far fetched. You can see the guy on the roof over on the left. So you can go up to the upper decks and sunbathe is the idea. But the niches are all filled with statuary, and uh, you know the cold the cold hall has several unheated plunge pools in them originally. Now let's take a look at what it looks like today. Here we are inside Santa Maria degli Angeli. The ground level has been raised by several meters, of course. These columns are truncated. But when we look up at the vaulting, that's the original vaulting, which is pretty amazing. So you're going to get a similar experience when you go into the Basilica Maxentius. You're going to get a similar experience when you go through the uh, the ruins of the Baths of Caracalla. But here, the faulting is all intact. Okay, now we're behind it. We're in Museo delle Terme. You see me walk through here. We made a video. We've made several videos on Museo delle Terme and the inscriptions and so forth. We'll do many more. But here's one of the archaeologists. And we had a nice time and a nice chat during the time of COVID, so there's nobody here. You can see modern glass where there would have been ancient glass. You can see the nice collection of different marbles. And we're walking over towards this doorway, this threshold, which was the original entryway uh, for the Carthusian Charter House. And now it's uh, it's in ruins, so it's placed over here and reconstructed. But you can see, uh, actually, this is the remains of the Tatio where we would have had columns, engaged columns. We would have niches for statuary. So we're, obviously we're missing portions of the uh, of the, of the Natatio. It's not that narrow. Uh, but if we take a look right here at this, we're looking right here at this uh, gateway, you can see that it's composed of reused pieces of marble decoration from the baths. Okay. Which I think we'll see better right here. Look at that. You just flip it around. Nobody sees it. You recover it on the other side. So, I mean, that's exactly how Rome is getting uh, recycled. It's getting chopped up. It's getting reused. It's being put in new uh, circumstances. And that allows us to appreciate uh, the original decoration. Here's, again, some more of the exterior. There's a lot of modern brick refacing, but so much of the original structure is intact making it one of the great monuments from ancient Rome. And the secondary interior courtyard, where you have, uh, again, part of the collection on display. I encourage you, if you haven't seen all of our videos on, on uh, Museo Nazionale Romano, we go to all the locations. We also have a, uh, a standalone video just on a number of inscriptions. So I hope you guys take a look at the resources that we offer. Okay, so again, Right now, we are in the midst of our challenge grant, matching challenge grant. It's a great opportunity to support or increase your contribution. This is the moment to do it because we have uh, the challenge grant of $45,000 from a number of our greatest donors. So do consider that before the year is out. We're a 501c3 and you'll get your nice tax deductible letter. This video has been brought to you through a grant from the CAAS Mashantonio Award.